Welcome. I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to this episode of the Future Money Podcast. Before we start, I want to say a big thank you to the half million of you who follow my content each week. This podcast, The Future of Money, is now ranked in the top 5% of all podcasts globally on Spotify. Thousands of you from over 160 countries globally are tuning in each week, so a huge thank you for all your support. As all you loyal listeners know, my goal with this podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we are seeing in the field of crypto, and hopefully empower you with this information, and then let you make your own decision on what their impact can be on the future of money and finance. To do this, I invite each week one of the leading figures of the global crypto community to have a one-on-one conversation amongst crypto aficionados and discuss some of these topics. By way of background, Dubai delivered another global milestone last year when it announced the launch of the world's first crypto specialized regulator, the Virtual Assets Regulatory Authority, VARA. After approving an initial batch of crypto players in its MVP program, VARA issued its Virtual Assets and Related Activities Regulations, probably the most comprehensive and advanced set of crypto-specific regulations globally. Today, we will dig into this topic, understand what is the vision behind Dubai as a global crypto hub. And separately, we will try to understand what is the approach behind the new regulations and what their impact could be, not only on crypto companies, but the crypto ecosystem as a whole. To discuss this, we have two VIP guests today, Deepa Raja Carbone, the Managing Director of VARA, and Hanson Orser, the CEO of VARA. But before we move forward, as usual, I want to make some disclosures. Nine Blocks Capital Management, the crypto hedge fund where I'm a co-founder and a shareholder, is one of the companies that was granted a provisional approval by VARA. In addition, due to the crypto specialized nature of VARA, many current or past sponsors of the show uh, or my content more broadly may also be looking at being either regulated by VARA or dealing with them in some capacity. Now that the disclosures are done, without further delay, welcome Deepa and welcome Hansen to the Future Money Podcast. Thank you for having us, Henry. As always, such a pleasure. Great to be here. Guys, Thank you, Henry. Guys, we have a lot to talk about. I spent my last Sunday spending four hours going to the rules in detail. Very impressive work, by the way. Both of you should be proud of what you accomplished uh, with that, with the new regulations that came out. Before we dig in about talk about more about Dubai, talk about the regulations, can you maybe each one of you share a bit about your background and how you ended up at the, at the VARA? Maybe Deepa, we'll start with you in a minute, and then we'll move on to you, Hanson. Uh, firstly, thanks, Henry. And uh, and what I will say is starting at VARA uh, was pretty much with, with the conceptualization of the birth of VARA, right? And I've been a Dubai resident for the last 18, 19 years. Uh, so I would say pretty thoroughbred as far as the Dubai ecosystem is concerned. Uh, Trade Center is, is sort of where I began and continue to retain my journey. And as you can, if anybody is in Dubai at this point in time, the traffic in Dubai is um, uh, is all thanks to to the event that's going on at our show, uh, trading venue, Gulf Food, right? And so the business really is very much about facilitating trade, uh, facilitating GDP growth from an economic perspective. And that's always been uh, what what we've stood for. Uh, Thereafter, our, our DG also got appointed as the head of tourism and head of economy. So I had a chance to uh, to sort of dabble a little bit in that for the last sort of seven, eight years, as far as the new economic horizons and growth are concerned. And that's led us into uh, VARA, right? Virtual assets being a very core part of what Dubai's future economy, the D33 plans have laid out right? With, between a Web3, AI, metaverse, and, uh, and crypto. That's pretty much a large chunk of our probably about 100 billion or so with regards to targets in the next 10 years. And that makes it a very important part of what kind of guardrails, regulatory ecosystem and legislative uh, environment we set up in order to enable that business. That's really how VARA got conceptualized about a year and a half ago. And uh, we got established as an entity about a year ago, um, 11 months at this stage. So that's a little bit about me, my background. Uh, There's a lot of topics in there that I want to dig dig more into it. We'll do it in a minute. Uh, uh, Hanson, uh, just over to you for a quick introduction. A quick introduction, and uh, as Deep and I kind of laugh about, uh, if you had asked one year ago uh, whether I would have expected to be here um, as the new CEO of VARA, which is the world's first virtual asset regulatory authority with his with the very first set of rules and regulatory rule books. Um, 
uh, put out on our website just two weeks ago. I, I would have never have predicted it. I spent a, a, a long career in traditional financial services uh, for over 25 years at um, the Royal Bank of Scotland and then also Nomura Securities. While I was at Nomura as a senior exec in 2018, our wholesale digital office launched a project called Komai Inu, um, which uh, was very, very early days to be thinking about a regulated digital asset custodian for financial institutions built by financial institutions. That entity went live in 2020, um, and I was asked to become president uh, and, and then also um, acting CEO of Komai Inu. Uh, which, uh, full disclosure, is uh, one of the entities in the MVP uh, licensing uh, process with VARA. Um, I came over here last March uh, to uh, meet with uh, Deepa and Vinit and, and Halal um, and uh, immediately saw the opportunity to pursue a VARA license, um, which was um, basically the... Uh, the direction of if we were looking for regulatory framework and clarity, here it was being uh, uh, provided. So we got Komainu on that path. Um, I stepped down to become a strategic advisor of the company and Deepa reached out to me asking if I wanted to maybe join the team, uh, have the vision and be part of this incredible project. Um, and lo and behold, six months later, I showed up in Dubai in the uh, role I would have never predicted. But it's it's great <laughs> to be here and, and very exciting. That's very crypto-esque. You know, uh, we always uh, expect the unexpected uh, from that perspective. Uh, that, thanks for that, guys. Um, really, Deepa, I want to focus on, on the vision of Dubai. You just mentioned this conference. Uh, as many of our listeners know, I, I relocated to Dubai as well. and This is my new residence now. I mean, around our office right now, there's a new, there's a conference with 150,000 attendees, uh, you know, and I think this is for the, the, the listeners of the show that are in over 160 countries. Sometimes it's difficult to grasp the, the vision and the scale of how things operate in Dubai. Can you maybe set the scene for us, Deepa? Like, you know, I've been personally very impressed when I come to Dubai, everything, the Every, every every project wants to be the biggest in the world, the number one. It's this pursuit of excellence, right? Can you share with us, what is the mindset? You've been here for 18, 19 years. You work with very prominent people in the government. What is the vision for Dubai? And what, what is the role of that virtual assets are going to play in this broader vision? Uh, so one thing, Henry, very rightly pointed out, you talk about a trade fair in a city, certainly Dubai is an emirate, about three, three and a half million people, right? Um, and you suddenly the logistics hub or utilizing your position as a logistics hub as becoming the trading platform for the world, one of the largest mice industries globally, which typically doesn't happen when you look at the other mice destinations at an international platform level. It's largely the ones that have a domestic audience as well, right? It's not solely relying on its international um, sort of connectivity. And even as I came in here way back when, uh, it was very much about being that hub and spoke model. How are we becoming the, the jurisdiction that trades with the Middle East, Africa, the Asian subcontinent, or India and the Indian subcontinent, and then, of course, uh, wider across Asia, and then there's Europe, right? So the Miasa region and the Minasa region at the end of the day became very much the core of what not only traditional uh, sort of logistics and trade um, banked on, but today it's no different. Uh, from, from a concept standpoint, virtual assets, right? So it isn't too different from where we originated, right? The, and yes, it's Gulf food physical environment, but you look at, at then the three years of COVID, right? Where no other country in the world actually had a my sector in operations. We only went down for, for like a few months of 2020. And we were the first country to recover coming out of mice globally. Right before the rest of the world actually restarted trade. And in that sense, it's, it's a very important marker saying that that was an environment where nobody physically wanted to be in an environment where they wanted to meet other people and trade. So the idea of saying a trade show is successful because 150,000 people showed up at a venue stopped becoming a selling point, right? That, that was actually the period when your um, marketing lingo needed to change quite significantly. And that's really the concept of virtual assets suddenly becoming uh, virtual 
industry in general. So the hybrid model of physical and virtual and then virtual assets coming as a, as a corollary and an add-on to it, right, naturally. So one of the things that you may be aware of, many of you viewers, Dubai just announced is Dubai 2033 uh, plans for G- GDP and economic growth, right? And one of the sort of dominant factors within that is the extent of foreign direct investment that is expected uh, to evolve, right? So 32 billion is is the number that we've currently got per annum, and we're expecting to get to about 60 billion, right? A cumulative of about 650 by 2033. So the 10-year horizon is looking at about 650 billion in FDI. And, And the government expenses are also looking to grow to about 700 billion or so by that period, right? So you're looking at a significant impact, input, uh, and stimulus coming in from government to support that kind of economic revenue generation potential. And digital economy is a very core part of it, right? I I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, a little bit earlier, 100 billion from just the digital economy is the number that we're looking at from a a, a per annum perspective. So that's going to come from the full broad spectrum, right? Not not just virtual assets. Clearly, that's one end end of the ecosystem, but that is Web3, that is Metaverse, that is AI and everything that goes with it. So very much gravitating towards here's... um, an economy that has traditionally been banked on, and you mentioned very clearly, the biggest and the best and the largest, right? So scale has been typically how Dubai has been positioned at the global context, but really quality, right? sustainability, the fact that it is the talent pool, it is the IP, and how do you sort of shift the mindset of people from thinking about just something that's transient to something that's a lot more permanent, and mm-hmm. we've got a huge role to play within that. To dig down more into this on this point, Deepa, why a crypto specialized regulator? I mean, there's various ways of dealing with virtual assets with this very ambitious goal over the next 10 years. Why uh, a crypto specialized regulator? And obviously, you became the first to have this actually in the world, which is a big milestone. But can you walk, walk our audience? What was the rationale and the thinking behind that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's a it's a great question, a very interesting one. Not that um, I mean, Henson actually made the point when we first started talking um, as well, right? It, it we didn't come into the industry. I, I almost want to say it's not a vertical; it's it's a transversal, it's a lateral, right? Um, we didn't come into the segment sort of saying we're going to be the first regulators. We actually came in as typical Dubai word saying there must be a global regulation or set of global rules that we can adapt, adopt, make more agile, make a lot more receptive to the market, to innovation in this context, because we are much smaller uh, sort of uh, population wise and are therefore possibly likely to be more responsive to market needs, right? So that was really the mindset as we came in with virtual assets as as a sector to pursue. And then as we looked around the world, realized, hey, there doesn't seem to be a specialist regulation uh, designed for the industry, right? That's not something that we came in thinking we were going to do. So just to be very, very honest, right? Uh, But we also then began to realize that trad five principles that are typically a copy-paste model that's applied anywhere else, sort of being stuck between here's a central bank and here's securities exchange. And somewhere in the middle of that, we're going to just shoehorn this thing, did not seem to work for an industry for the last 15 years. So as as a consequence, you were left with an ecosystem that really wanted to contribute effectively as responsible participants to an economy, but felt like they were unable to do so because there wasn't a regulatory ecosystem that they fit into naturally. And we just felt it was it was our responsibility to be able to structure it in a way in which if we're expecting that level of responsibility from the market that wants to be decentralized, that wants to be democratized, we should certainly support it. But we need to give them the kind of guardrails that protect the market, right? And what better place than creating a sandbox in Dubai for the rest of the world, right? Being the sandbox for the world, if you will. This is very impressive, actually, and music to I think many people in the crypto community who want to be regulated and they're just looking for a framework they can comply with. And actually, Henson, I want to move it to you because what Deepa is saying is obviously, uh, Henson, you've had the privilege of working with many regulators uh, over the years is kind of a stark contrast with what we're seeing in other places, notably the U.S. right now, where there's a regulatory by enforcement and other other types of, let's say, um, tr- ways of trying to actually control the, the ecosystem. From your perspective, Henson, do you think the model that Vara has followed is one that will be followed by other regulators around the world and something that other jurisdictions should look at and potentially get inspired from? So, Henry, great question. The The... 
uh, principle of, of what we've constructed here, A, is something that we have the goal or ambition or it's open uh, and facilitates uh, interoperability and passportability. Um, and our rule books and our framework uh, start with four compulsory rule books where any VASP in the system has um, supervision and compliance and operational soundness and informational uh, integrity um, where any regulator in the world should be comfortable with the way that VASP is constructed and how it operates. And then secondly, we have a whole set of rule books, I think eight, uh, based on activities. So if somebody is doing some basically traditional financial service activities, be that exchange or broker dealer or custody or borrowing and lending, we have separate rule books to govern those activities. And sort of as Deepa just mentioned, rather than trying to classify a particular token or currency as a security or a commodity or a fiat rep representative, um, and then shoehorning that into an existing set of, of regulations, we've, we've set it up where we don't make that differentiation, and yet we have compliant um, operational VAS that are permissioned by the activities that, that they're performing. And we think it passes the test with how other regulators would want to make sure that entities are FATF compliant and in investors um, are protected. So we follow um, the announcements that a lot of the other tier one international regulators are making. And that is another aspect of Dubai as a, a, a sandbox. It is a, a system where this idea could be conceived a, a law could be passed, law number four in 2022, to establish VARA, and then an, an entire set of rules and regulations could be published all within 11 months. It's, it's really inconceivable when you think about the ability to move the needle um, from a regulatory framework. And we hope, A, either we are just passported um, or uh, we serve as an example how other people can operate. But at the end of the day, we recognize some of these technologies are very global in nature. And yet when we think about affording investors protections and having sound um, operations, that is going to require a regulatory framework. And, and the news events that we saw in 2022 have been a very stark example as to why a centralized gateway to crypto exchange that also provides custody and borrowing and lending and market making if your first inclination is to trust, we realize that needs a regulatory framework to verify. Absolutely. I think this the way that you describe the approach is uh, very, very interesting. I would say really having gone through all the rules, uh, this is by far the most advanced crypto framework that exists right now uh, in the world. Uh, even more than that, uh, I think it's very interesting. The part that really impressed me the most is that the beginning of the rules, you guys write that these rules are like work in progress. You know, we may amend them as they go, which I think is a very honest way of looking at things, you know, and at the regulatory frameworks as well uh, from that perspective. Maybe for the benefit of our, our listeners, I want to give them um, kind of an overview. If you could give a, I don't know if either you, Hansen, or Deepa, you want to take this, but kind of the high level framework. You know, obviously there was the MVP program, there was the FMP program, and, the, and the type of VAST that could be licensed. I don't know if either of you can walk us through the process and an overview of the regulatory regime. Uh, so at least our listeners can have an overview of how it works. So with the um, FMP rule books going online at vara.ae, um, we now are uh, officially in business. And we, we've gone from this, this MVP phase to now having final rule books. And so what we're left now is with three cohorts of VASPs. There are several hundred legacy VASPs who are operating currently in Dubai. They all need to, to fill out a, a, a questionnaire and, and declare themselves. And we'll make the decision as to which ones of them are, are um, operating regulated activities that require FMP licensing. They'll have about six months 
to fulfill those requirements, which ones uh, are just registered activities where they have to register with us, which ones are um, don't need to register, and which ones are uh, operating activities that they shouldn't and, and need to cease and desist. We have the the cohort of, of, of the VASP who have been helping us craft this framework and this environment, part of the, the call and response of, of figuring out these rule books, which we also consulted with subject matter experts internationally and other international regulators. Um, so those MVP, that MVP cohort has until the end of June 30 uh, to uh, satisfy the FMP uplift uh, to get final licenses. And then we'll have, we'll have new applicants who will be coming into the system. Deepam, I don't know whether you'd like to add anything to that. Sure. Just a, a couple of points and very, very comprehensive uh, sort of process, right, for, for all the entities that are looking to operate here. Uh, and we've been in dialogue with, with most of the, the local domestic market uh, participants for over a year now, right? Uh, so it's, it's important to get that sense of clarity. The um, so there are three points that I want to make. One is the assumption that the market has uh, virtual assets, crypto, people don't want to be regulated, or they have more regulations, they want to move to jurisdictions that don't have them. Absolutely, from our experience, not, not accurate. Right. If anything, we've found most of the entities that we've interacted with more than willing to be regulated, wanting regulation, seeking regulation, actually struggling with the lack of regulation. Right. And that's the point that, Henry, you were making as well. The, just the fact that there isn't one that exists. And so where do we go in order to almost get legitimized? And in the last sort of two weeks or so, there's more of that activity that you would have seen, certainly in the last quarter. There's a, a flurry of that kind of activity of responsible participants wanting and seeking a proper regulator. So we are, we're seeing a lot of that interest. It's important to understand that there is a process flow that, that will be enabled. But the second part of that is banking, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And the ability to, to be able to have a banking presence, not just in the country that you're operating in, but also across the sort of international uh, ecosystem, so correspondent banks and, and such like. So that's been a constant uh, debate, discussion, dialogue with, with the VASPs. It's not a one-size-fits-all answer. It's not a straightforward answer. It really is very much a, a chicken and egg. We want to see you operate. We want to see you responsible. We want to make sure that you are taking your responsibility as seriously as we are before we enable you because we've got obligations to investor protection, client uh, and market risk protection as well. That's the bank's position. So it's a little bit of unless you give us a client account, we can't operate, right? So that there's that un constant debate that we are combating as well. It's our responsibility, our obligation to entities that come in within our ecosystem to ensure that we are, we are providing the ability for you to be able to have banking support within the setup. And I have to say, tremendous amount of support uh, and, and sort of cooperation, collaboration from our federal entities, right? Whether it is the central bank or is the securities exchange, it's a constant dialogue, it's, it's a handshake, and it is certainly a, allow us to work with each other to ensure that a regulator is not set up with a set of rules that becomes a race to the bottom. It's got to be something that that is comprehensive in a way in which the, the interests of both the market and the participants are safeguarded. Uh, and we've got tremendous support from the central bank in doing so, right? So that's just one thing to, to note for the VASP that are coming to talk to us as well. Yeah, and I think uh, it's not uh, only when you have regulatory clarity, but also backing support, which is essential, right? So it's very good to see that there's been coordination on that side, which is a problem, frankly, across the industry where vast majority of crypto companies around the world now are literally banking with two banks in the US, one of them which is in trouble. So it's very interesting, that dynamic. Sorry, Hanson, I interrupted you. Apologies. The, the, um, and when we think about local banking partners, Henry, and, and notions of, of client accounts, as well as uh, custody and wallets and, and regulatory capital. These are all to afford protections if, if things go wrong at our, our VASPs. Um, and if you think on the one hand uh, of jurisdictions where you can pay expensive lawyers to get a license, you can rent a compliance officer, and you can have a commercial address with 20,000 other um, of businesses um, versus having regulatory capital in country, um, the sanctity of, of client accounts, um, and, and then responsible people and a compliance officer as well as board members 
all tangibly here. We're trying to construct something ultimately at the end of the day that that affords investors protections that that in some instances they they didn't have um, throughout 2022 and are now dealing with the consequences of that. So let's talk about that, Hanson. I think you raise a good point, right? So let's take an example of crypto exchanges, right? Obviously, we had the collapse of FTX and many others in, in 2022. In the new regulations for a VASP, let's say for a crypto exchange, uh, there are some very interesting requirements. One of them is proof of reserves. Uh, second, they need to, pro- of course, provide financial uh, statements, audited statement, but also there's twice a year independent audit of the business uh, by independent uh, third party. Do you believe that having the, and, and by the way, for the custodian, there needs to be client separate, segregated client uh, account and so on and so forth. Do you believe these protections in place will help us avoid another FTX scenario or another scenario where, uh, let's say, uh, Things may not be as kosher within an organization as we thought they would. So, so the answer is yes. And I think of the journey of um, a, a crypto. So on, on the one hand, Henry, you can have very sophisticated crypto individual sovereign self investors who have their own hardware and their their own wallets and their own keys, your keys, your coin, they know how to navigate DeFi. Um, and, and obviously DeFi survived just fine throughout last year. H- having said that, less sophisticated investors have, have used these one-stop shopping on-ramps as, as gateways into the system, some of which grew exponentially and ended up having many millions of users and many, many billions of assets on their own balance sheet. So at these one-stop shopping, you had uh, exchange and order management systems, you had custody, you had market makers, you had allegations of market abuse with with wash trades and spoofing and um, all manner of stuff. You had products like yield products, um, even staking, not necessarily with with full disclosure, and you had um, a, a borrowing and and, and lending. Um, if if you had sophisticated um, financial fraud, um, and the and the system went down, you you left investors completely exposed. So to the extent, if you look at TradFi for when there are centralized, trusted, one-stop shops and gateways into the system, you have qualified custodians. You you have market makers that are independent and not on exchange. Um, You don't have individuals with unsecured credit risk with exchanges. Um, and, and you you have um, fiat banking accounts that are in in the name of the investors, and those are are, are protected if things go wrong. So so yes, it, market conduct and and separation of activities is one hundred percent designed to protect investors at the end of the day. Even for example, uh, while reading the rules, I, I recommend anybody who's interested in this from our audience to go on the vara.ae website and you can see the rules. But uh, even on prop trading, you know the the rules require that if you're doing any prop trading, it needs to be separate entity. Everything needs to be disclosed. Which, frankly, some of the events that happened would have never happened if these uh, firms had followed some of these uh, requirements. Uh, one thing I want to I want to bring up as well, which is as we're recording this, a couple of weeks ago there was a lot of these enforcement cases against. Uh, staking in the US, for example. And there's overall, let's say, movement against DeFi, whether it's a BIS or FATF or whatever you look at. What I found very interesting in the regulations is that we actually provide some kind of framework for off- offering staking services. And even we refer to DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, which I know some regulators have tried this in the past from you know Wyoming in the US to the Marshall Islands, but it was the first time that I see it in a very structured uh, framework. Can you share maybe from your perspective, again, I don't know if Deepa or Johansson, you wanna take this, but the, the approach of how we wanna approach things like staking and even uh, DeFi, but let's say uh, DAOs more generally. I'm just going to make a comment on the general principles of it and then um, uh, um, hand over to Henson to talk about the topic uh, per se. So in the way the framework itself has been set up, very much around understanding that innovation is something that is going to be a constant piece within the industry, right? And that's the reason we don't want to 
look at it as a vertical. It's something that's going to cut across every single aspect of a GDP. And as a consequence, um, Henson mentioned right up in the beginning, we're not regulating by product. We're not regulating by technology. We're kind of agnostic uh, to the tech that underlies it, right? And it's very much, and I still clear from principles based, but yes, in that sense, it's from principles based, but the framework is very much about saying, here's here's a set of guide rules, right? The, the, the rails on which an economy broadly operates. And these are things that allow you to have its activity base. It's not going to be hugely different from what you, you see in Trad5 from an activity perspective, but the way you operate it in a virtual environment would be hugely different, right? And as a consequence, we are allowing you to, to ensure that innovation is not stifled by the boxes that we're sitting setting in this context. When you talk about DAOs, right? It's not something that one would have imagined you need a regulation around a year ago. And it's a very different context that you find yourselves in today. So as a regulator, you don't want to be preventing innovation. And you also don't want to be preempting it in, in any context, right? Uh, so that those are just two sort of broad principles to, to bear in mind as we uh, as we think about it. And that's also the reason why the regs are set up in, in, in the way in which it says it is a dialogue, it's a conversation. It's not to say it's a moving goalpost, but to say once you are are looking at an environment that is new, you would have that kind of sandbox and uh, space within the regulatory ecosystem where we can try and test it and have that dialogue constantly with the industry in order to create the right kind of guardrails for them, right? And that then brings you to stable coins slash custodians slash sort of DAOs and, and the kinds of things that you would need to deal with. And, and Henson, I'm going to defer to you for, for specificity on some of these aspects. Part of our framework, as you know, Henry, is about investor disclosure. So if I take an extreme example that a crypto platform offered extra yield on FDIC guaranteed deposits. Um, as, as an extreme example and a hypothet, that was improper. And clearly looking at the earn and the yield product um, and assuming they were deposits or that those were uh, your coins or your fiat or your stable coin um, w- was a poor decision to, at the end of the day, be lending unsecured to a high-flying crypto platform at 3%, let alone 12%. I, I, don't, I don't know what the unsecured lending should be to a high-flying uh, a crypto platform. Um, and so to have proper investor disclosure around that um, and, and determine whether your assets are in custody with a big C and if things go bad, in, in your assets are bankruptcy remote. That's a, that's a different conversation or, or whether you're an unsecured lender to whatever platform you're dealing with. Um, pr- proof of stake tokens and um, v- validating th- that protocol by, by staking your tokens and getting rewards for that is, is a completely different concept. Now, to, to offer yield and not have proper disclosure around what staking is or for unsophisticated investors to not understand that is one thing. Uh, To have sophisticated investors want to buy proof of stake tokens and and put them in staking protocols. And you can even do that, which some of our um, MVP operational or operational VAS will be doing. You can have the integrity of custody while still encumbering your proof of stake tokens into a staking protocol. You do have risks of uh, that if your nodes don't perform, and sorry to go down the rabbit hole, that you might get slashed, but you still have the integrity of custody. So that's a, a different bird altogether. And if there's proper disclosures around that, pe- people might opt for that. Uh, Hanson, also, um, just one thing as we're coming to the end of the show, but really I want to talk about, you mentioned that the right disclosures, right? The marketing rules. Um, you know, as somebody produces content, I get approached every day by token companies and this and that, basically offering me pumps and dumps or completely false. I mean, it's a really incredible how there's a whole industry of marketing and basically scams as well that exist in the space. Uh, Dubai was very innovative as you actually put forward very interesting marketing rules as well. Can you maybe share from your perspective, what is the approach when it comes to the marketing rules and disclosure rules that we want to see? You mentioned what, what it relates to staking, but let's say more holistically uh, when it, as a policy, from a policy perspective. I'll actually push that one to, to Deepa because she 
uh, I came in late in the in in the game to to actually crafting and, and writing the regulations. I could talk to it, but she she was responsible for writing it. So maybe I'll have sure. her take her stab at it. Um, look, marketing very much right. It, it, it's it, the retail consumer first. The industry from from an investor perspective uh, has been the priority, right? And uh, and the first thing they see is what what people sell you, and in that context marketing was the first thing we came out back in June summer of last year right uh, to say when you're in market whether or not you're operating if you're targeting a retail mm-hmm. consumer and particularly the ones that aren't your institutional investors that that can afford to take the risk that's where we'll come down extremely hard unless you're you're licensed to do it unless you have full disclosure and what you're selling and more importantly not one of those you know uh, make 500 percent returns after you buy this token it that's that's not an advertisable statement that you can guarantee to the market when you come in right and events becomes a very large part of it so we're very very core bread and butter as far as device concerned absolute no uh, unless you have a license from a regulated entity so that's yeah. a, a no-brainer and it's, it's a given right and that's something that we would come down extremely hard on you know, uh, last question before we move on to the fire round of questions, uh, Deepa. But you know, one question I get asked by a lot of people around the world, and I, I presume that it's going to happen even more from people in the U.S. now that are looking to, let's say, relocating, is they want to come to the region. They want to come to Dubai. But mm-hmm. always a perennial question comes in. Should they come to Dubai? Should they go to Abu Dhabi? Should they consider Riyadh uh, or Bahrain or Qatar? More specifically, let's say in the UAE, between the, uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi. I know this is a question I'm sure you've been asked a million times before. But if you had to speak now to a crypto CEO who's trying to think about this dilemma, what would you tell them? What do you think are the pros and cons uh, for both Dubai and Abu Dhabi? And what should shape their thinking? What I would say is I, I would consider this a UAE situation, right? As as long as you're looking at the UAE as a jurisdiction, the GCC wider, of course. But as far as the UAE is concerned, like our, our targets are very clear. I've, I've mentioned D33 a few times as far as Dubai is concerned. Top five global logistics hub, top four global um, financial hub in the next 10 years, right? And you're already sort of in month two of, of the first of those years. That's a target that we are going to go after and going to go after very aggressively. Anybody that's that's seen the history of Dubai over the last 50 odd years uh, and the leadership's vision, it's not about just setting a vision and a goalpost without a game plan to get there. So that it's it's been a very measured and a very progressive sort of approach. It's 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 a vision with an aspiration. One can call it ambitious, audacious, but Ultimately, it's achievable, right? There are targets that are very strict KPIs, governments measured by it more so than private sector. And they're very aggressive sort of, um, n- not, not just sort of the target, but if the roadmap is missed, then action is taken and it's almost instantaneous. And so that's some, something that people know about Dubai's uh, uh, leadership and its vision for the last 50 years. So I don't think that there is anything to question uh, as far as being able to achieve that end state is concerned, but we don't operate in a silo. And we fully understand that our success is very much dependent on the growth of the wider region. We are the hub for the wider economy. We are the port for the rest of the region to flourish. So I don't see Dubai being in a silo to I mean, certainly not to, to the rest of the UAE, but certainly not the wider GCC either. So I would say as long as the world is looking at the region as the hub for them to be able to pass for their product, that's a big win in and of itself. Very interesting. Well, Deepa Henson, we're coming to the end of the show. My favorite bell is with me. So I'm going to ask quick questions and I need one or two word answers. And my bell is here to keep us uh, honest. Uh, hope you guys are ready. Yeah, go for it. Let's get cut off. I'm going to start with you, uh, with you Deepa, on this one. Uh, what's your favorite thing to do when you're not working as a regulator, Deepa? Well, thinking about working as a regulator. <laughs> Henson. Uh, exercise. I guess, uh, here we go. This one, I start with you, Hanson. Favorite thing to do in Dubai as a newcomer? <laughs> yoga. Y- yoga, really? There's actually a lot of great yoga studios, actually. Deepa, favorite thing to do in Dubai? Uh, when I'm not being a regulator, you mean? Yes, yeah, so, so yeah. giving, giving uh, Hanson tips in yoga. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that people get wrong about Dubai, Deepa, I start with you. One thing that people get wrong about Dubai. Uh, they do think of it as a transient destination. I've been here 18 years. Yeah, it's 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 a one-way flight. Yeah, exactly. Hanson? 
so I came to Dubai and the, the Middle East for the first time last March from the U.S. So I was flabbergasted at what a cool international cosmopolitan yeah. hub this is. I don't know what my expectations were, but I was like, man, <laughs> this place yeah, is absolutely. going off. So same absolutely. sentences, New York, Paris, Tokyo, Dubai. Exactly. No, absolutely. There's a lot of buzz in town, that's for sure. Uh, Deepa, I'll start with you. Uh, what is exciting you the most about the future of the crypto industry? Uh, just the fact that it's 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 not crypto, right? It is virtual assets. It's here to stay, and it's going to be defining what the next sort of twenty years, thirty years of our our future looks like. Excellent, Hanson. DeFi. DeFi. Here we go. What is, what is the one thing regulators are get wrong about crypto, Hanson? So um, that it's a public ledger. And there, yeah. there's more dark arts going on with dirty hundred dollar bills than there is on a distributed ledger public blockchain. That's true. Deepa. Um, just the fact that they think it can be shoehorned into something that exists. Right? <laughs> Two last questions. If you could launch a crypto startup tomorrow, in which vertical of crypto would you want to launch a crypto startup? Deepa. Wouldn't. It's a horizontal. I'm not going to show <laughs> <laughs> Consistency. I love it. That's it. I would say um, individual artists of uh, pr production and royalty rights. Here we go. And to finish it up, this episode, this special episode with uh, Deepa Raja Karbon, the managing director of Vara, and Henson Orser, the CEO of Vara. Henson, I'm going to start with you. The, the traditional future of money question. If you could have lunch or dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would you want to have lunch or dinner with? Jerry Garcia. Oh, really? Interesting choice. Why is that, by the way? I'm a deadhead. Here we go. <laughs> Deepa. Um, actually, a lunch or dinner. I don't know. Which one of you wants to be in the virtual world, right? Having lunch and dinner. More than happy to do it uh, in, a, in the sandbox at some point in time. <laughs> Deepa Hansen, thank you very much for being on. I know for the for the benefit of our audience, uh, the rules are uh, are available on the vara.ae website. If people want to get in touch with you, Deepa or Hansen, as Twitter, LinkedIn, what's the best way? Where can people find you guys? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah. You can DM me on LinkedIn. I get I get to all of them. We both do. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you very much again for everybody. Hope this was a useful insights on uh, what Dupai is doing and what Avara is doing when it comes to crypto regulations. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in and see you all soon for another episode of the Future of Money podcast. See you guys soon.